And there you are, Hidden Nation. It is so good to see you. Welcome into the studio. You got Josh Carey here. It's your Hidden Entrepreneur. Hidden Nation, we're in for a very, very intriguing conversation. Before we hit the uh, on-air button, I got to know our guest a little bit, and there is a lot here. We're going to be joined by our guest, Fred W. Scott, who, among other things, is the author of the book, Open Doors to the Glory and Praise of God. It is available right now on Amazon, uh, also in Kindle form, if that's your thing. So go check that out right after our conversation. Uh, Fred, welcome to the program. Welcome to me. Glad to be here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, besides the book, which we're really going to dig into, um, I just want to orient the audience for a minute. The book really talks about how uh, God, in your perspective, opens doors and closes doors, divine intervention, how things just unfold in our lives, right? Do I sort of have that right, positioning right. correct? You know, times that you think it, you're lucky to be in the right place at the right time, and no, it's the God is intervening. And, and uh, if my first uh, several years in veterinary medicine, um, I didn't know that. And uh, I just thought I was in the right place at the right time, just amazing things happening. And then uh, later, after I became a believer, that I uh, really realized how many times he's opening doors for me and, and just um, uh, raising me up to, you know, this is a farm kid that was a, a, what he accomplished in veterinary medicine is just, you know, amazing. He just uh, just kept uh, raising me up to heights that I would never have been able to accomplish uh, on my own. And yeah. It, and so my so book is my book is really a tribute to to God and showing what He's doing, not not me, not not showing what I did, what wow. the Lord did. Um, and and what's interesting is uh, you were telling me that for for a good portion of your lie life earlier on, you were not a believer. So what That's happened? True. That's true. Yeah, I. I, I was 30, uh, uh, 37 years old when this all happened. And I call it the Damascus Road experience, you know, it's mm -hmm. all going to uh, Damascus and he was zapped by the Lord and and uh, became Paul. And, and uh, I didn't change name, but uh, I did have a, quite an experience anyway. So can you tell uh, us about was, the experience? The research that, that we had done on feline infectious diseases and about in the mid 1960s, the cat was just beginning to be an important um, animal coming into veterinary clinics, and um, uh, there hadn't been any research prior to that time uh, on most of the diseases. And and suddenly, I had information on uh, the most important, the most serious disease in cats at that time, on how to vaccinate and the age to vaccinate and that sort of thing. So that that information uh, needed to be passed on to the veterinarians so they could, uh, these new vaccines that were coming out that we evaluated, you know, not didn't make the vaccines, but we evaluated them so we could show what the, um, uh, what the benefits were of them. And so I was started traveling, uh, opening the, the uh, different veterinary meetings. You know, I had no public speaking uh, training or anything. And suddenly here I am speaking to a, a group of practicing veterinarians talking about feline infectious diseases. And and uh, I might have, you know, 100 or 200, I might have a, a, a thousand veterinarians that would be there. And, uh, you know, so this was quite, I was having to learn uh, on the run, you know, how to, how to get, provide that information to those veterinarians. So, well, anyway, I've been doing this, and I was out a couple of months, probably twice a month on the average, you know, and it might be for one day, might be for for several days, you know, and uh, doing these uh, programs. And um, so anyway, my wife had been, been felt that there was something missing. She just felt there was something missing. So one day she was invited to uh, go to a tea for a bunch of women by a neighbor, um, and so she went and listened to the stories and uh, the testimonies of these women, and telling them that uh, they had to have a you had to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. She'd never heard that, 
And so that was news to her. And so she came back home and, you know, in a couple of days, a couple, three days later, she committed her life to the Lord. Well, things changed at home at that point. <laughs> I mean, it, Christian radio was on and pamphlets were appearing here all over the place. And books were, <laughs> Christian books were appearing. I got to tell you, I wanted no part of it. I mean, I was, you know, I was resistant to everything. I, I wouldn't even talk to her, you know, about anything like that. <laughs> I thought I was doing okay by, my, by myself, you know. And, uh, yeah. I didn't need that. So I, I was totally, totally resistant to it. And and one night, the Lord you know, spoke in some way to me and said, you better listen to Lois. So I, I, well, I stopped and listened. And she had a pamphlet there from the Campus Crusade for Christ, as it was known then, you know, the four spiritual laws. She went through that with me. And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. Now, I, I didn't make any commitment or anything at that point. Suddenly, the Lord provided an image. To me. Can't tell you how he did it. But I was on this road, the road of life, going down this road. There was a fork in the road ahead of me. And he made it explicitly clear. Again, I don't know how he did it, but I didn't question him a bit. If I took the right hand fork, I would continue on my way and my marriage would be done. And I and, uh, that got my attention in a <laughs> hurry. And if I took the left hand fork, there was a sign there with a signpost. And a little sign, Jesus Christ. And so he made it clear that I could accept Jesus Christ and take that left hand fork and my marriage would be healed. Boy, it didn't take me long to decide which fork I was going to take. That actually happened over you know, 51 years ago now, I guess. And you said it was like a vision, right? You it saw was a vision. Uh, yeah, he gave me that vision. So I could see. And you were in resistance so I, it's not like you were looking for it, but you yeah. were shown this. I was shown that. How do you how do you really to the layman just put out there what that was? What happened? What was that? Well, it was he made it very clear. He had that's what his his mechanism for this resistant person, he was able to show them. And uh, what has happened now, the people are, are seeing these visions, for example, over in Iran and a lot of the other countries there. The Lord is using visions like that to to bring them to the Lord. And uh, um, so it's not unique, but this was unique in, in my situation. To you. He gave me. Do you, was, do you think that we're all in one way or another, right? Can it be argued that? through all of us most days we're being shown certain things but how open or resistant we are to it no well everybody comes to the lord in a unique way i think generally speaking mm -hmm. and uh, mine was <laughs> unique and that's for sure in a way of it but uh but that's what the lord knew that that was what it was going to take to get my attention and uh and boy, he sure did. You know? So, and, and from that from that point on, my life was changed. You know, um, I had I had a whole bunch of new friends, and <laughs> and then in a couple of weeks, my wife said uh, I'd like to go to church on Sunday, and I said, Yeah, that's fine. I'd love, oh, well, where do you want to go? And I hadn't been in a church in twenty years, and in, uh, in Ithaca, I didn't know any of the churches in Ithaca. And she said, well, listen, there's a church here called Bethel Grove Bible Church that my friends, uh, my new friends are, are saying that's where they go. And I've said a lot about it. And I, she says, I'd like to go there. And I says, OK, let's go. And I walked into that church. And that was, oh, you know, 50, 51 years ago now. And I, I, I sat in that sanctuary and I could feel the Lord there present in that in that sanctuary. I mean, it was no question about it. And uh, I said, boy, I want to come back here again. <laughs> so we've been going there for 51 years now, that church. And, uh, so. 
you mentioned Ithaca. Yeah. That's where you are. You've you've been in that home, you told me, for over 50 years in the area of Ithaca for o- over 60 years. So you you have roots there. What's significant yeah. for you about family and, and, and remaining in Ithaca all these years? Well, when we moved out, we were in, in Ithaca on what's called Sapsucka Woods Road near the Ornithology Laboratory. And our kids that were growing up, three boys, and they were all through the um, sanctuary and growing up and watching the birds and everything there. And so, but when we moved out here with the three boys, the oldest was a sophomore in high school and then on down. And, um, and so we can make with, with, with three boys. And now we have um, 11 grandkids and 30 and 28 great grandkids. So wow. We have this whole, uh, <laughs> bunch of family but boy it is uh they're so so blessed to have all those families and we built you know and with the use of my sawmill we built a, a what we call a great hall so we could have a lot of people because we we couldn't have thanksgiving together we had to rent a restaurant or something you know there were so many of us and uh so so we built well, starting in 19 20, 19 or 2019 we started <laughs> building this great hall at my son's place, which is only half a mile away from him. So it's beautiful. Uh, so we can, you know, we can see easily seat 50 people in there. I and mean, we could seat a hundred if we had to, you know, but, but, and they've got a beautiful swimming pool there. And, and then, so all during the summer, we have a, what we call Sunday fun days. Oh, wow. And the kids swim in this beautiful swimming pool that Dwayne made. And then, uh, and then have a, um, a picnic of some kind afterwards, you know, barbecue or um, something different every 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 week. But uh, for about fourteen weeks over the summer, why like, that's what we do. We're pretty so, well wrapping that up now for the fall. But uh, so. so the sawmill that you referenced has been a recurring theme in your life. I know you grew up. Uh, as a young boy on a dairy farm uh, in Western Massachusetts. Uh, and there was a sawmill involved even yeah. then? Yes, my dad had a, a sawmill, quite different than the one that I have now. But uh, but he sawed lumber and he sawed lumber for a, uh, a camp that we put up in the Adirondacks. You know, I was only about 10 years old when this happened. <laughs> so, But I would help him a little bit, you know, on the, on the, when he was sawing logs. That we cut off the farm there. And uh, so, yeah. And then I asked you um, before we went on air, I said, how do you spend your days today? And you mentioned that you have a sawmill and you you do that for a hobby. Yes. Yes. Tell me about it. Well, we just bring the logs in. We uh, we um, have caught a few trees, quite a few trees around here because this is a CCC camp and uh, they, they planted a lot of um, Norway spruce and um, and red uh, red uh, pine and a lot of other th- trees around here. So we've we've cut down a number of them that were impinging in the house and uh, uh, over the years. And but we mostly you know we'll buy a, a load of hemlock or whatever species of, of, of that we want to work with, and they come in with a a, a load of of logs and unload them there and I have a tractor that I can pick up the logs with and move them over to the mill. And, uh, and of course people are always wanting to borrow the tractor, you know, so, but that's what it's there for. So <laughs> that's, and, and, uh, because so many of them live right close by. I mean, we, we now have, um, uh, what do we got? We got Four of the grandkids that have families you know, live within a half a mile of us. And so beautiful. And there, are, there, there are um three of them that have six kids, and then the other two have um other one has three. And so and then there's two other two other families that moved down to South Carolina. That's another whole story, but but we're just um so blessed to have these kids around and uh, your family. And oh, I just and they come in, you know, we have to keep the <laughs> well they were knocking on the door and in the kids, you know, there might be one, it might be three or four or five. 
can we have a cookie? So, yeah. we so you have, have you have three kids, eleven grandkids, and twenty something great grandkids. Twenty eight. Yeah. The oldest like, great the oldest great grandkid is um, uh, twenty four years old now, and he was born he was born completely blind. So that's been an interesting uh, journey with him. Tell me more. About about Nicholas? Sure. Um, What's been interesting? I, no, that's that's and my my daughter, uh, my granddaughter, I mean my oldest granddaughter is in uh now in in just across the line in from Charlotte into South Carolina and she's had a home health business where she um, has people that, that uh, help people in their own home. Mm. Now she's recently bought a 40 acre horse farm and she's going into a full full blown uh, uh, senior care facility there. So, on when different you, levels. Yeah, when you talk about um, the Lord and specifically the book, right? Open Doors, it's mm -hmm. called. Uh, uh, we can wrap our heads around um, how God opens doors for us, but you also talk about how God closes doors for us in a positive way. Yes, yes. Tell me, tell me about that. For example, I, I've been out of uh, out of college, veterinary college, and I was in Rutland, Vermont, and I wanted to be a, a dairy practitioner. That's what I that's what I wanted to do. The only veterinarian that I knew was a dairy practitioner that came to my came to my dad's farm and took care of the cattle that were there. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I was up in Rutland, Vermont, and doing cattle work and small animal work. And, and I got a call from a veterinarian locally in our area that I grew up in. He wanted to give me his large animal practice because he was going all um, small animal. And he says, I want my, my large animal practice just taken care of. I love you know, patients taking care of, you know, their, their farms. And he said, you, you can use my office. You can use my two-way radio, you know, until you get set. And uh, so I said, man, this is something. I never heard of that happening to anybody. And I thought, boy, this is a call, you know. And, and well, one thing happened to another. And then I, I started talking more with my wife. And she said she knew me more than, better than I knew myself. And she said, you know, you grew up on these dairy farms and the Great Depression and World War II and how everybody was struggling so much. He said, you will not be able to charge the, the farmers the amount that you should in order to make a living at this. And I thought, wow, you know, that was a and she was absolutely right, because I, you know, I, I saw my parents struggling, just never had any money, you know, they were struggling to, to make a living, you know, and uh, during, through, during the Depression and World War II. So anything, one thing left to another, and I started looking and and visiting other places, and then um, I uh, was sent down to, it's called Plum Island, which is off the east coast of Long Island, and uh, there's a uh, research facility down there for diseases that are not in the U.S. And so so they sent me down there to work on foot and mouth disease for a year or two to see if I would like research. And I did. And so um, in the meantime, I had applied for a graduate program there at Cornell in virology. And and, um, and I thought I needed to get a, an, an, an NIH postdoctoral fellowship. And so I did. I got that finally. And uh, so I started in this research program uh, in this working in this center for infectious diseases in a cat. And uh, then one thing led to another. One day um, I was in my third year of graduate study and had not even started looking for a job. My mentor came in and said, there's a new tenure track faculty position that's just been approved in the state budget for the veterinary college. So he told me what it was. He said, are you interested? And I said, sure. We shook hands and he said, okay, you've got it. Go down to the, the department chair's office and sign a few papers. That's how I got this tenure track faculty position uh, at, at Cornell, the veterinary college, and, which I had for 30 plus years and then retired from it. So. Weren't looking for it. Ah. Opened the doors. 
But now refresh in that story. Where was the closed door? Whatever happened with the large animal vet practice? Well, I just I just turned down the offer. You did, right? Because I, of the I conversation did. with your wife. Yeah, I, we we talked it over and uh, and uh, and I didn't I didn't resist that at all because I knew I never thought of this. But she was absolutely right. I mean, I hated even when I was in practice in Rutland, I hated to charge the farmers what they should be charging. I was charging them four or five dollars for um, a, a farm call at that point. You know? <laughs> so why? What was going on in your head that you 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 just couldn't bring yourself to charge them what it might have been worth? I was brought up that way. I mean, I was brought up and saw saw my parents struggling to make a living. I mm. mean, they had plenty to eat because we grew, you know, big gardens and and we had plenty of meat and um, uh, but you know they never had any extra money and so they um. When I when I decided my my junior year in high school I wanted to become a veterinarian I finally decided that would, uh, that, that was what I'd like to do would be a large animal practitioner but um, so I went home told my mo my mother and she said um, why don't you become a real doctor <laughs> imagine that how does <laughs> but anyway but how does the I said no I want to work on animals not not people and uh, anyway. Uh, they were very supportive of, of my going to veterinary school. Yeah. But they said, we have no money. We can't pay any tuition. You'll have to, you'll have to be on your own through all, all of this. And so turned out to be 11 years of college before I got through with it. The last three, I had uh, financial support that came in. My wife was working for five of those years and I had no money other than what I, little jobs that I could work at, you know. And uh, so, when she when we graduated, they uh, they had a an organization called Vet Wives because most all the veterinarians at that point were men, mm. and they had a beautiful uh, the dean's wife had, had really met with the wives all the time, and and then when she, when we graduated, uh, they had a graduation party, and uh, they gave a diploma to all of those women, and the title of it was putting hubby through <laughs> and boy, they did. So anyway, how does the, when we're talking about, um, you know, trying to overcome your own upbringing lens of not knowing that you won't be able to charge the farmers, the fair market value of what the service mm -hmm. you're offering is because of the way you were brought up. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It was, that how was does, that was yeah. My, yeah, the way I was brought up. Yeah. Exactly. How does, how do you see the Lord helping you reconcile that? Is that something you then should walk away from? Or is there a process where you should still be able to step into the role and eventually charge the right fee? Well, it would, it would be a learning process. I mean, I, I would have eventually learned about it, but there was quite a thing, number of things happened. And I had a Another mentor at the veterinary college that when I was going through, I used to work for him and a, a fabulous large animal veterinarian. And and he gave me a lots of advice, you know, and uh, more advice in 15 minutes one time when I stopped to, to see him. And uh, and uh, so uh, there was another practice uh, nearby that had offered me a job. And he said, well, um, he says, that practice may not be in business in a, in a year. There were four veterinarians in there, and he was very close to them, and he knew that they were going to split and go four different ways, you know. So I almost got caught in the middle of that, you know, and, yeah. and I didn't have a clue that that was going to happen, but he did. And so he's the one that got me the job down at working on foot and mouth disease because I said I'd like to to I think I'd like to do research, but I haven't I've never had any experience with it. He says, "Well, let's go down there. They're looking for a veterinarian." And uh, you can do research and and uh, and see if you like it. Then you can go back to graduate school. If you don't like it, you can go right back into clinical practice. There's no problem. So that was the dividing, a dividing point there. So the book Open Doors 
is it seems like I'm listening to you and your story and your outlook on everything. It's almost like you, you, you have to get out of your own way and just allow life to unfold. Am I reading that right? Well, it, uh, yes, yes and no. Uh, things were opening up and I, and, you know, long before I became a believer and about 50 years after I did my initial feline research, which was key to going out to the veterinarians and providing. So this is what the story is. You can vaccinate these kittens at 12 weeks of age and then repeat it in four weeks and, and they're going to be immune, probably immune for life, you know, and, um, and I, I was trying to grasp how this actually happened. I mean, it was such a beautiful situation. And I thought, kept always thought, well, I, boy, I was fortunate to be the right place at the right time. And now it was more than that. And it, probably 50 years later, I'm, I'm trying to grasp this um, as, I'm, as I'm starting to write the book about all the things that happened. And the Holy Spirit talked to me spoke to me clearly one night. He said, I placed you in the epicenter of, this is the plan I had for you. I placed you in the epicenter of feline research so that you could work on this disease, panleukopenia, which is the most dev devastating disease in the cat at that time, so that you can transmit that information to the veterinarians, the practicing veterinarians, so that this disease can be totally controlled. And within 10 years, this disease was totally controlled. I mean, the Lord had this all planned out. I didn't know about it <laughs> until, until afterwards, but he told me it was 50 years later when I, uh, when I got that clarification. Are we all getting these clarifications, but just have to be aware to hear them or see them? Yeah, there was no vision or anything on this. This was kind of a verbal type of uh, presentation. So, right. Yeah, if you're listening, uh, you know, and uh, you know, and 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 talking with the Lord and keeping in touch with Him. Yeah. Um, you know, He'll He'll get in touch with you too. And so, Fred W. Scott, the book is "Open Doors to the Glory and Praise of God: Hidden Nation." It's available right now on Amazon. Uh, like I said, it's in paperback form or you can get it in Kindle version. It is certainly worth a read, no matter where you are on the side of the Lord, like the first part of Fred's life. Um, he wasn't, and then uh, he most certainly is and was now. Uh, Fred, wrap this up for us. What is the overriding message for the listener you can leave us with? Well, in this case, if you're looking if you're kind of retired and are a child of God and you look back on your life, you'll see where the Lord opened doors, closed doors, uh, directed, redirected. Uh, and uh, it, it's just so it happens to other, other people as well. And in this case, uh, he was directing me for whatever reason. He wanted me in veterinary medicine and he directed me to get into veterinary school and get through um the school and into research and was able to you know raise this naive farm kid up to unbelievable heights and within this fabulous veterinary medicine career you know so it's just uh, i'm so blessed in uh, so many ways what a story. What a message, Fred. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to know you, to be connected now, to have gotten to know you more and to introduce you to our listeners. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing and for being you. Thank you for this opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. And there you go, Hidden Nation. Thank you too for investing your time. Uh, I'm sure you got a thing or two out of this conversation. Whatever that is for yourself, go out and take an action. Put something good into the world. Be seen, be visible as you always are. You know that's when the good stuff really begins to happen. I want to thank you again for tuning in. We're going to bring you another great episode soon enough before too long. Until we meet again, Hidden Nation, take care, be well. Thank you.